with all right welcome back to as it should be paul bertolino here in the world famous as it should be studios and well at last at last here we are i'm go i'm finally doing the second installment in the autographed album series i yeah i mean i did one i don't remember how long ago it's been months and um you know i i have a number of albums that are autographed some of which have stories that go along with them. Some of them are just a matters of like of having gone to like an in store, you know, and waited in line for like five hours or whatever, and gotten a quick signature. Um, but some of them actually have stories. And well, here and there, I'm going to be doing these episodes um, where I give you stories on a handful of the albums. And and on this episode, I have five albums chosen uh, that I'm going to give you just the, the, the fun, stupid little stories that go along with them uh, because it's fun. So let's get started. Okay, so first up, I have Especially For You by The Smithereens. Yeah, this is the first Smithereens full-length album from 1986. And I have uh, Jim Babjack, Pat Denizio, and Dennis Dyken on this. I don't have Mike Mazeros uh, because I got this autograph in 2012 and he wasn't back in the band yet. He wasn't playing with them. They still had uh, the Thriller on bass um, but now this album this is an album that I really got into right when it first came out when this record came out in 1986 and MTV was playing behind the wall of sleep video it got my attention immediately I went damn I mean it just like boom like the minute I saw that video I was like I have got to get this album and I, I went and I bought it and I'm not gonna go too much into actually into my history with this album not too much because well the albums of the year series we're probably going to be hearing about this, and I'll want to go into more detail on that video. But uh, yeah, I got it in 1986 when it came out because I saw that uh, because I saw a Behind the Wall of Sleep video on MTV, and it quickly became a favorite album of mine at the time. Now, then Smithereens, of course, in the in the latter half of the 80s, became one of my favorite bands, and I saw them. I saw them not on this album, but I saw them uh, the following year on the Green Thoughts. When they were out doing Green Thoughts in 88, I saw them that year. And I actually met Pat and Jim at that show, too, but I didn't get anything signed. No, no, I did get something signed. No, you know what? I did get something signed. And I have a picture of it. I'll show it here. I got a t-shirt signed. Here you go. This is the t-shirt I bought at the Green Thoughts show that I had Pat and Jim sign afterward. And I've never, ever worn it. They just signed it in ballpoint pen, you know because that's what we had. And um, and, and, and so I, I've never worn this thing. It was giant. Back in those days, I mean, it was difficult for me to get t-shirts that were my size um, because I was even smaller than I am now. But uh, yeah, so then uh, so the next time I saw them was in December 1991, which was on the... Ooh, December 91. Uh, which album was that? It's I'm putting it down below here because I can't think of it right now because the red light's on and my brain vanishes when the red light goes on. So yeah, that album right there. Yeah, I saw them on that tour. My friend Sean and I got free tickets because a friend of mine who was working for Tower Records had tickets to the show and said, hey, you know, I'm not going to this. I have tickets. You guys want to go. So we went and saw Smithereens on that tour, and it was great. They were great on Green Thoughts. They were great on that tour as well. And uh, then I didn't see them again until I saw them one more time. One more time. Now, Kenny's Castaways is a club that is on Bleecker Street in Manhattan here in New York City. And that is a classic club that goes back, you know, well, the Smithereens were playing there in the 80s. Like, that was the first club, that was like their home club. When they came to Manhattan, that was like the club that booked them regularly. And they started playing there in 1980, and they have, they, they practically owe their careers to, to Kenny's Castaways because nobody else in Manhattan would book them at first. I mean, they, but that's where they made their name, and that's why we have the Smithereens now. So, in uh, October, or was it November? It was October of 2012, Kenny's Castaways was closing. They were closing down after decades, and the Smithereens, they came and, they came and played on the last day. Well, actually, technically, the last day was uh, the previous day, uh, the last day of September. Well, on, on October 1st, 2012, even after they were technically closed the night before, they... they were open for one more night. The Smithereens came in and played a free show. And 
and I went. I was there, and I brought this record, and watched. Went and was right up front, and watched them completely blow the doors off this tiny ass little club, you know, on Bleecker Street, the very club that they played their first shows in Manhattan at, and they just were phenomenal. And then afterwards, well, actually, it was before the set, really, because I came in kind of early, and there was hardly anybody in there. But like Pat was in there, and I don't know about. I don't think I saw any of the other guys until a little bit later when they were starting to set up. But Pat was already in there when I walked in and I got him to sign the record. Here's a picture right here. Here's Pat and I, right after he signed the record. See, he looks very, very happy to have signed this record. And, yeah. and then after that, like I said, they, they, they played this really, really incredible show that just blew the doors off the place and really, you know, saw Kenny's castaways out in style. And, you know, and then I, over the course of the evening, I mean, you know, it's, it's a little club and the smithereens aren't exactly you know, snobby rock stars or whatever, like they're hanging out, they're at the bar. You can easily approach them and have them sign records. So I had them sign this album, finally, a record that I had wished to have signed since 1986. And, uh, well, at last, here it is. All right, so next up, the Bell Records debut, the 1973 Bell Records debut of Barry Manilow. Yeah. Look at that really terrible, terrible scribbly autograph I got. Um, but yeah, that's, that's truly Barry. In fact, uh, yeah, I got, it, I got it myself. It's an autograph what I got myself. He, this was a, maybe when was this? Was uh, 10 years ago or so? He was doing Manilow on Broadway in Manhattan. And Crystal Durant, as you know, who you know from the Singles of the Year series and now the Albums of the Year series, uh, she and I went and saw Barry. And the thing is, is that it's on Broadway, so you know how Broadway shows are. After gigs, or after, after, after the play, they have it set up outside the exit door where, where the crowd kind of, uh, they, they gather with a little rope there, and, and people kind of come out and they wave and they'll sign programs for people or whatever as they're waving and saying goodbye. Well, this was no different. I mean, like, you, you stand up at the edge here, and, and Barry comes out, and he comes around and waves hi to everybody. If he's in the mood, he comes out and he waves hi to everybody and signs stuff and takes pictures with people and stuff and kind of goes around. And so, yeah, I. what happened is that Crystal and I went to see the show. He was doing it every night. I think, wasn't it? I don't know if I remember if it was every single night or if it was once a week, but he was doing it. He had a regular gig there. So, like, we didn't do this the night we went to see them. We went to see them and then I saw it kind of going on afterwards, like I saw everybody kind of waiting and queued up for him to come out, and I went, oh, boom, you know what? I'm getting my record, and I'm coming back tomorrow night, and I'm gonna get right there on the rope. And I did, the very next night, I grabbed my Barry Manilow album, and I went up, and I got there early enough. I wasn't in, in the show, watching the show, so I was able to get right up there when nobody was there, and just stand right there at the front. And then, of course, everybody started to fill in after the show, so I was right there. And yeah, he came out and went right around, and in fact, I have footage. Somebody was shooting this and put it up on YouTube, and I and I found it and I got it. Here you go. There's Barry coming around, and there I am right there looking at him like, holy shit, it's Barry Manilow. Look at how plastic his face looks. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And he and he signed my record. You you see the footage of how he did it. Like he's standing there and he's going through really quickly. So the autograph is really. Not very good. But hey, I mean, when else am I going to get Barry Manilow's autograph? It's not like I'm not going to be seeing him at the bar at Kenny's Castaways, so, you know. But yeah, so there you go, Barry Manilow. Okay, so now this next one. Ooh, this next one is an album that runs deep that I feel that I'm so fortunate to have, well, one signature on. Oh, man. I bought this record when I was 13. And it immediately, it, it just impacted me, and, it, and to this day, it's one of my favorites. Again, you're going to be hearing about this, spoiler alert, on Albums of the Year. But uh, that album is Something Else by The Kinks. Yes, oh my god. See, I have Dave on it. I have, I have Dave's autograph. That's, that's the only one I have. Getting Ray's obviously considerably tougher. And getting Mick Avery is actually a lot tougher too because I don't think he's really ever in the US. And uh, Pete Quaife is impossible because he's no longer with us. But yeah, so this is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful copy that I have, original pressing, tricolor pressing I have of something else. It's not the original one that I bought when I was 13. I still have that copy and it's still in pretty decent condition, but this is a really beautiful one that I bought maybe about five or six years ago. and. 
so so lucky to have gotten this one you know and then like before getting a chance to meet Dave but now the whole thing now how I met Dave really was actually an in-store like I um, was talking about um, but l let me give a little just a little bit of history behind that I mean Obviously, I've been a Kinks fan, like I, like I already mentioned, since since I was a teen, like since I was 13, 12, 13 years old. Um, so my own history goes back with them pretty far. But uh, I used to have a roommate, John Crop. Shout out to John Crop. He is a graphic designer, and he's over the year over the years done a lot of work for Dave Davies. I don't know if he. I think he's done website work and just different graphic kind of stuff. And well, Dave was in town, and he was in the area. And suddenly, you know, one morning, there's a call from Dave's wife, who's Dave's manager, and says, hey, so Dave wants to come over and meet John. Is, is he around? Cause can, can Dave come over? And like, you know, John popped right out of bed and yeah, yes, Dave could come over. It's like Dave wanted to come over and, and meet John personally because they never had. And, you know, just basically say thank you because of all the, the nice work that John had done for Dave. And then... So this happens, Dave comes over and John meets him, and then I get to, John sends me this photo. Oh, here's Dave Davies and I in front of, in front of you know, the place where I used to live with John, and which was a complete mindfuck unto itself. I mean, there's Dave and John, my ex-roommate, in front of the place where I used to live with John. Um, and there you go, that was just like completely just like, wow, that, that was amazing. Well, okay, fast forward about a year or two, and he is in town because he is promoting this yes a decade it's a collection of unreleased Dave Davies stuff that Dave's son put together you'll see he signed that as well this is this is an item that this is what he was promoting and this was at Rough Trade Records in Brooklyn back when it used to be in Brooklyn now Rough Trade Records had the main record store up front and then in the back had a venue and peep bands usually do an in stores would actually do a set in the back at the venue uh, well, Dave came out and did a Q&A on the stage in the venue in the back, you know, two chairs of somebody interviewing Dave, and he did a Q&A with, not only with the audience, but with the guy who sat, sat there and interviewed him. And then after the Q&A, we all went out into the venue, or not the venue, the record store area, and queued up for him to sign our stuff. And, you know, got to sign, got to go up, and he, he not only signed my record, my Decade album, which was what he was there to promote, but he was kind enough to sign my something else, which I was so grateful for, because these days everything's so corporate, and it's like, you know, no, they're only signed the thing that they're promoting, and that kind of, it wasn't that way with Dave, man, he was completely casual about it, and I was able to say, hey, you and I have a mutual friend, John Crop, and he was like, oh yes, I know John Crop, oh yeah, I know John, yeah, so that, that was, that was really amazingly cool, and you know, here's a photo, here's a photo and I with Dave, now, it, the funny thing about this photo is I look completely chill and at ease, but I'm absolutely shitting my pants. I can't believe I'm standing next to Dave Davies and that he just signed my something else by the kinks. I mean, whew. yeah, but yeah, so that's half of a dream come true. The other half is if I can get Ray. Ray, if you're watching, let's, let's make this happen, okay? So next up is a completely different type of album. This is actually not a music album. This is a comedy album, okay? And that is Bill Burr, live at Andrew's house. Yeah, see, I got, I got Bill's signature right there. Now, this record is, uh, this is a, a record he put out in 2014 of a gig he did at Carnegie Hall in 2011. And the reason why it's called Live at Andrew's house is because Carnegie Hall is really stingy about using their name. Like, like he would have had to pay some enormous fee or whatever, I think, to, to put their name on the cover, or like they just wouldn't let him. I, I don't remember exactly the story. If it was like some exorbitant fee, it would have cost him to put their name on the cover, or they just wouldn't allow it, or what it is, whatever it is. But also, you can't use photos from the gig either. Like, this is him on stage at Carnegie Hall, but this is like earlier in the day, like when they're doing sound or getting sound, like nobody's in the venue. He's just up there posing like he's in the middle of a set. But if you look in the seats, like nobody's there. So this is like, this is the best he could do for a photo. Like he had to kind of like, you know, cut corners. And Andrew Carnegie is one of the, you know, one of the gods of Carnegie Hall. So that's why it's called Live at Andrew Hall. Take two. So that's why it's called Live at Andrew's House. That was kind of like, he, you know, Bill Burr's smart. He figured out ways to get around all this stuff. Um, of course, on the back, we have a picture of 
you know, the balcony there with actual people there. Um, so yeah, I, I bought this online back, you know, because he he, puts, he has a couple of vinyl records out. He has his Carnegie Hall gig, and then he has his first MSG gig, Madison Square Garden, uh, which I missed out on. But he puts these out as really uh, limited vinyl. Anyway, so uh, as far as how I got it signed, well, fast forward to November 2018, and Bill was going to be at... Uh, Paley Center for the Arts on 52nd Street because he remember he had I think he still has uh, the cartoon series uh, Epis for Family and he was premiering the second season Epis for Family had been out for one season already but he was just about to premiere the second season and he did an appearance at the Paley Arts yeah uh, the Paley Center where he was showing just I think the first episode of the second season and he was there and did a Q&A and all that kind of stuff and, and I went and I brought this record in hopes that somehow, some way, I would be able to, you know, meet the man himself. And so, and this was the, uh, by the way, this was the night before he was playing Madison Square Garden for the second time, which I went to. I went to the MSG show the night after that. So, you know, it's kind of like dual reason for, for Bill Burr to be in New York. And so I went, we watched the episode, Bill came out and did the Q&A. And then that was it. Like it was like it was over, and everybody stands up, and Bill's leaving, and I see somebody run down to the front, and who has this record, and they caught him, and he signed it. And I was like, oh shit! So I got my, I got the record, and I rushed down. I'm trying to get past, and by the time I got down there, he was like gone. Like he went out a side door, and I'm like, ah, ah, I just missed him. And like somebody had, I, I had just watched somebody just catch him and had and have him sign that exact record and i was so just like ah so near yet so far and i just went okay well that didn't work uh, so i'm not gonna be bill burr uh, whatever so i put my record back in the bag and and i go to leave and everybody's we're all queuing out i'm in i'm amongst the cattle leaving the venue or leaving the the place the little theater there and you know, you go down the stairs and, you know, and down the elevator and all that stuff to, to get down to the first floor and walk out out the front door, out onto the street. And so I'm, I'm kind of really, I, I feel like the way I remember it, I wasn't really, by the time I got to the lobby of the building and was exiting, I wasn't really amongst a whole crowd of people. I don't know why, but it was kind of really just me and maybe a couple of other random people, kind of, you know, stragglers walking out. And as I'm walking out, there's a guy right outside the door. A driver holding up a sign that says, Burr. And I'm like, boom, this is his driver, and Bill has not left the building yet. So I stood right there, right next to the guy who had the sign that said Burr, and waited for Bill to come out. Sure enough, within 30 seconds, here comes Bill Burr. Boom, hey, Bill. You know, I, I just I, yeah, asked him if he'd sign the record. Oh, yeah, sure. Signs the record. And I just, like, it was a really quick thing. Like, he and I didn't really have a conversation because he's trying to get to his car because he had another gig that night. He was actually doing a, a, a gig where he was playing uh, playing drums. I forget where it was. But he had, like, like, three seconds to be at, like, some venue in Queens or something where he was playing drums with somebody. And so he was in a big hurry. But so he was really nice to stop. And, <coughs> excuse me. So he was really nice to stop and sign my record. And because he was in a big hurry, I didn't get a picture with him or anything, but now I really regret that I didn't because after he walked away from me, somebody else accosted him and he's, he took pictures. Like he's standing there with a big smile, arms around everybody taking pictures. I'm like, fuck, I should have gotten a picture. And you know, so I don't know, maybe next time. Maybe next time I just happen to run into Bill Burr, I'll get a picture, but I don't have one now. But hey, at least I have this. Okay, all right, so. This is the last one. This is the this is the headlining act here, and uh, in a big way, in a big way, this is the headlining act. Woo! Uh, well, this is Kiss Destroyer, signed by all four: Paul, Gene, Ace, and Peter. All four of them, and uh, and I got all four of these autographs myself. Uh, it's three in three three different occasions. It didn't I didn't get them all in one shot, um, but this was a little bit of a journey there, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, I mean, this, this record goes back to when I was six. Not this copy, although it may look like it. It's a little bit rough with some ring wear and whatever, but uh, at the time when I had the opportunity to get the first autographs on this, this was the only copy I had, so I, unfortunately it's not on the best copy, but 
I have a fully signed destroyer. I'm not really going to sit here and, and him and, and you know bellyache over a little bit of ringware. But anyway, so the first autographs I got in this were Paul and Gene. I got those. Uh, well, on two different days, but it, it's hard to... It's same event, two different days, uh, sort of. Okay, let me, let me explain. Let me put this record down, I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain. So, in, in 2000, KISS were on their farewell tour. Remember that farewell tour? The first farewell tour, the one with Ace and Peter. And they were coming through, and they were going to be playing in town at a show... I don't think I... Oh yeah, you know what, they were coming through again because I had already seen them on the farewell tour but I think they were coming back around again. You know, Kiss, when they say farewell, they do it for a long, long time and they come around and they say farewell lots and lots of times. Well, anyway, yeah, I think this was after I had already seen them on the farewell tour and they were coming back so I didn't even have tickets for the show because it's like, I've, 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 I've done this. So, but anyway, so they're coming through and, well, one of my roommates... Uh, well, this is when I also when I was roommates with John Crop, who the guy who who worked for Dave Davies. Now, our, one of our other roommates at the time was working at the hotel that Kiss was staying at when they came. And well, I guess while while Kiss was here, they were one of the things they were going to be doing is they had to they had a stack of posters that they had to sign for the Kiss auction auction aux, take two for the Kiss auction. You guys remember the Kiss auction in 2000? Yeah, they had these big orange posters with a, a shot of Kiss from 1977 and that they were they were selling on their website and they were selling signed copies and only Paul and Gene were signing them. Um, but they had to sit to sign them. And so what they did is there were two different days, you know, early and maybe around 11 o'clock in the morning or whatever, or roughly, where the first day was Paul and the second day was Gene where they had to come in and to sit at the table and sign the posters. Well, in order for them to do this, they needed they they needed to employ two guys to handle the posters. One person on one side of the poster, the other person on the other side of the poster, you hold the poster, they sign, you move it. Sign, move to the next one. Sign, move to the next one. And it's like a little, you know, you're like in a little factory there, you know. Well, John Crop and I were those guys. Our roommate said, "Hey, you guys want to do it?" Yes. So yeah, so we basically, so the first day was Paul Stanley, and we show up there and we're sitting in this little banquet room with a table there, just not knowing what's going to happen, waiting for Paul Stanley to arrive. And Tommy Thayer was one of their, uh, one of their road managers at the time. So he was there, it was him and some other guy who were kind of like basically prepping us and getting us ready and going, okay, yeah, this is where you're going to be. You know, and Tommy had short hair and like khaki pants and a button up shirt type tucked in like he looked like a road manager and I mean he was really nice both those guys were really nice and they got us basically ready to ready for the big arrival of Paul Stanley and the funny thing is, is that when we were sitting there and waiting I, at this point I had never met a member of KISS I had never met any of them like nobody not even like you know Mark St. John and so we're sitting there waiting for Paul Stanley to walk into the room and I started to have a panic attack. I'm like sitting there and it's just rising and I'm like, oh my God. And then I'm looking, I'm kind of looking over this way, kind of starting to freak out. And while I'm not looking, the doors over here, Paul Stanley comes walking in. And the minute I look over, there he is. He has entered the room, he just walks in. And the minute I saw him, his energy and just his vibe, I completely, like my, my little anxiety attack just like just just vanished. I immediately felt relaxed and was like, oh my God, there he is. So he comes in and we meet him and hey, hey, Paul Stanley. Hi, I'm Paul. Hey, hey, hi, I'm John. And all right, so he sits down and we, we, we start doing the poster thing. And it was like 45 minutes. Like we just, it was just John and I and Paul Stanley, just the three of us for 45 minutes shooting the shit while he signed posters, just having a casual conversation. Like he had just been, like he had just been to, Mar uh, where was he? Yeah, he'd been like to some sort of uh, theme park or whatever with his son Evan. Yeah, like his son Evan was still a child at the time, and he was talking about that, and we were just talking about music, and yeah, it was just this this great. It was like a little hangout with Paul Stanley while he while he signed posters, and I remember standing there. He's sitting, we're standing, and I'm looking down, and I'm like, I could see down his shirt, and I'm like, holy shit. It's Paul Stanley's chest hair. I'm like, look at the, the Paul Stanley chest hair. I've looked at a thousand times on a million 16 magazine pinups. There it is. 
But he was really nice and personable. Not at all. He wasn't at all a prick. He wasn't at all entitled. He was just just like a, he act, he was a regular guy. He signed he signed my my destroyer. And then we said, hey, can we take a picture with you? Sure. Like he's like, okay, let's stand up over here, and we take a picture. And here's the photo. So here we are with Paul Stanley. See him with his fists. He doesn't want to touch the great unwashed. <laughs> but you know what, man? He was really cool about taking the picture, and it was Paul Stanley, after we took this photo, who said, here, let's take another one, and to make sure it comes out, to make sure it came out. Okay, so we took two. You know, thank you, Paul Stanley. And that was a childhood dream come true, met Paul Stanley. Okay, well, the next day was Gene. And, well, so we come back the next day, and we're sitting in a different little banquet room in the same hotel waiting for Gene. Well, you remember how I said that Paul Stanley came in the room and every like the whole air well basically the whole air in the room changed, everything was relaxed, and I just like my 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 anxiety attack just completely vanished. Well, when Gene came in the room, the air changed in the room too. It became immediately tense. Immediately tense. He comes in and he's like you know, with his blue button-up shirt, you know, buttoned up down to here with his leather pants on and his hair and his little, you know, uh, uh, Davy Crockett ponytail and, you know, a hat on. And he just kind of walks in. I, I want to say, I think he was talking on the phone. That's right. He was talking on the phone and he comes and he sits down to where we're doing this. And he just sits there and proceeds to talk on the phone for like the first 15 to 20 minutes that we're there and didn't even acknowledge that we were there. And John and I are just like moving posters as he's signing them. And he, at one point, he was talking to Shannon Tweet. He was like talking to Shannon. How, how are the munchkins, he says, about his children. How are the munchkins? Mm, okay. Yes. Blah, blah, blah. Just like talking to his wife about his kids on his cell phone while we're helping him with his, phone, with his, with his posters. So then he, he has another phone call, and it's some sort of business deal situation or whatever, something that's not quite going quite right, and uh, something where Gene isn't quite happy. And he, I remember him saying to the guy, I am not accustomed to being treated this way. Anyway, well, finally, after he made his little business calls and his family call, he got off the phone, and then finally he acknowledged that we were there. And, you know, he was condescending and a dickhead the whole time. He... I remember actually when he first walked in, he went and got coffee. He wanted decaf, and there was no decaf, and he was really pissed about that. There was no decaf, I could kill. So it's something to that effect, because, you know, Gene is a teetotaler of the highest order. Like, he won't even have co uh, caffeine in his coffee. But, so once he's off the phone, and we're all, you know, we finally exist, and he's finally talking to us. Yeah, we start talking music and whatever, and John and I were really, at the time, our favorite bands were people like Red Cross and the Mups and like all these kind of bands. And Gene goes, why, why do you guys, why do you insist on liking these bands that don't make money? I just, you know, we like these bands because we like their music. It isn't anything, I don't really, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with whether they make money or not. If Red Cross was a gazillion selling band, but still made the same music, I would still like them. I don't like them because they don't make money. I like them because I like their records. But you know, that that was just like Gene, that doesn't compute to Gene. What, liking bands that don't make money? Ooh. Anyway, and he asked me the name of my, well, and John says, oh, Paul's in a band. And he says, oh yeah, what's the name of your band? And uh, I was in a band called Persephone's Bees at the time, and I told him the name Persephone's Bees, and he's like, what, what, what? I can't even pronounce that. What is that? And he starts telling me what you need. You need a band name that's short and to the point. Blah, 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 blah. Something like The Electric Chairs, which is a band name that he's always been obsessed with. Like he's wanted to have to put together a band of preferably all girls called The Electric Chairs. And he was really just selling that as his thing at the time. Something that never got off the ground, obviously. But so, yeah, you know, our, we, my band was wrong because we didn't have the right name because Gene couldn't pronounce it. That's your problem, Gene. And uh, so, as things settle in, I mean, like Tommy Thayer and the other road manager dude came in and was like, oh, how are things going? Oh, okay, yeah. And Gene loosens up a bit, and he proceeds to pull out his Polaroids. We've all heard about Gene's Polaroids. Well, he had his Polaroids from the previous night. 
and he pulls them out and he's showing us all the Polaroids from the night before. And he and it's he has it's two girls, it's two girls, and he has one picture of the two girls with one. How do I explain this? One is on all kind of all fours, you know, bent over, and then the other one is on top of her, kind of in the same position. And he goes, "Look, butt sandwich." Tommy laughed, and you know, John and I were like, "Holy shit, is this really happening?" It was it was completely surreal. I mean, to be sitting there with Jean at all, but. It was completely surreal, but him showing us his Polaroids, we literally fucking saw his Polaroids, which was crazy. And well, then the authenticity of the Polaroids was proven because five minutes later, the two girls in the photos came walking in. Yes. And they came in, and of course, Gene suddenly became Mr. Charming, because he was like, Mr. I'm pissed off because I don't have decaf coffee, and I'm, he was being an asshole up to that point. Well, well, suddenly he's Mr. Charming, because the two chicks, he, I, well, I don't know if he banged them the night before, but he sure as hell took photos of them. Um, yeah, well, and then he again starts going, oh, we'll see, I'm going to form, these are the two girls I'm going to put together in a band. It's going to be called the Electric Chairs. Blah, 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 blah. More hot air. But anyway, so it all comes to an end. We get all, you know, the posters are all signed and it's all done and, and I have him sign the record. I, I really, honestly, he, he was so unpleasant to be around that I, I did ask him to sign the record, which he did, but we didn't even ask to get a photo with him because he was just, it was just, the, the meeting really kind of left kind of a bad taste in our mouth. There were certain things that were fun, like him showing the, the, um, uh, the Polaroids and, and just the fact that we got to do it but really the actual but just like the whole the tense air in the room and he was just a, he was just a jerk and so we didn't we got, I got the record signed but we didn't get a photo with him unfortunately and then as he's walking out he turns around and he goes it was, he's, he's, he's singing the Adams Family theme by the way he keeps singing the Adams Family theme like it keeps coming up and he just keeps singing it so he come, goes sauntering out the door singing the Adams Family theme. And he turns around and he goes, don't steal any posters. And walks off. And that was that. That was Gene. And, but what was really, so uh, that was really uh, kind of like a really good experience and a really kind of weird, odd, bad, tense experience. But I'll tell you what, they paid us not only did they pay us actual money to do this, but they gave us like 10 free passes to that night's show. So we got to go see Kiss that night for, for free and call up a bunch of our friends and say, hey, meet us at the venue. We're all getting, free to, getting in free to see Kiss. So we went and saw Kiss for free that night too. So, okay, fine, Gene was a dick. Overall, it was, it was a pretty damn amazing, positive experience. But anyway, so that leaves me with a destroyer that has Paul and Gene on it. And, well, who knows how or when I'm ever going to get Ace or Peter, right? Because they never, you know, they're in the band, but they never show up to stuff like this. I mean, they weren't even going to have them sign these posters. Well, fast forward years later, I mean, years later, we're talking 2016, maybe? Uh, was it? Yeah, it was 2016. Ace Fraley was going to be out at Chiller Theater in New Jersey. Uh, all you New Yorkers know about Chiller uh, out in Precipity, New Jersey. It's kind of like a, a, a Comic-Con kind of thing, but for music and movie and horror film kind of stuff. And people show up there and they they take pictures with you and sign autographs for a fee. And Ace was there. And I and, and I went along with my friend Nick Dikovsky. Shout out to Nick Dikovsky. And we went we went there together because Alice Cooper was also there. And well, we went to, to go meet our heroes. And I, and I brought my Destroyer album and queued up and paid my money and, and Ace signed my record. I mean, there's no story there. I mean, we just went to this, this event where Ace is, making, is basically being paid to sign your stuff and he signed my Destroyer. And that was kind of that. And then that's, that's how I got Ace. And then how I got Peter was maybe a couple years after that, there was a KISS convention in Manhattan and Peter was, one of the, was the guest. He was the big guest and he was there sitting behind the table signing stuff and I'm trying to think now did oh yeah you know yeah you had to pay you had to pay and it was expensive and you had to pay and I waited in line forever 
we waited in line. I can't even tell you how long we waited in line. And when I got up to the front of the line, I, I finally come up to Peter and hand him the record and say, hey, Peter, how you doing? He goes, um, I'm all right. How are you doing? He says, and because uh, I'd heard, because he didn't, because he didn't show up the day before. It was a two-day event. He didn't show up the day before because he was sick. He didn't feel good. So I was asking him how well he, how he was, because I heard he was sick. And I said, oh well, I heard, I heard you were sick yesterday. He goes, oh well, I, I was all right. It was no, no big deal. No big deal. Oh, okay, so you didn't show up to this fucking event because it was no big deal. Okay, well he, he must have, you know, had a hangnail or something and just didn't feel like showing up. Luckily, he showed up the day that I was there, and he signed my record. But unfortunately. He fucking signed right over Ace's face. And I was so... Like, he signed it over Ace's face, and and the guy who was helping them, like, grabbed it and pulled it away. And I was like... Cause like, not pulled it away to take it away, but to take it to the next cable, because they, they want you to rush through, because they have this whole line of people getting autographs, and they needed to get me in there and get me out. And I'm just, like, standing there kind of, like, you know in shock afterwards like okay I just met Peter he signed my record and he fucking signed over Ace's face and I walked over and I looked at it and I was like oh I was so bummed but you know what I mean it, for, for quite a while I, I, I was just so bummed that he'd signed like, cause it, cause it would just been so beautiful just right there right but you know what I'm completely over it now I'm just completely I'm just nothing but lucky and fortunate to have a fully signed Kiss Destroyer. I mean, this record goes back to when I was six years old. I mean, I got this record when I was six, when it was when it was current, and I mean, there you go. Okay, there you go. There are my autographed record stories for this episode, and uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Kiss one was really long, but yeah, well, the the road to get those autographs was long, and <laughs> as yeah, it was it was quite an event, but. Uh, yeah, so anyway, thank you to everybody who watches the videos, and thank you to everybody who's subscribed, but if you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing, and if you do subscribe, maybe ring the bell, because then you can get notifications, and uh, yeah, maybe uh, come back on Thursday, because, well, the Albums of the Year series begins, yes! We, Crystal Durant and Tommy Von Voigt and I, we just wrapped up our Singles of the Year series, and now we're beginning the Albums of the Year series, and our very first episode is coming up this Thursday. We're doing the, uh, the 50s as a whole decade. We're doing the full 50s as a decade for one episode, and then after that we're going to do individual years. And, uh, well, so come back to check that out, and, uh, well, thanks everybody, and get ready! <laughs>